Good morning. Thinking about the fruit of the Spirit, but, and they are love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. And we're thinking about faithfulness today. Um, in terms of trying to figure out a definition for faithfulness, a couple things. It, the root is conduct that honors an agreement or a bond. Somebody makes a bond with you makes an agreement with you. Faith or faithfulness is conduct that honors that bond, that honors that agreement. And faith and faithfulness really are the same word. And so when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit being faithfulness, it really could mean probably has the sense of both faith and faithfulness. When we think of faith, faith is the act or state of believing in someone or something. And biblically what it means, when God issues his covenant agreement with us, faith begins with hearing that and then believing and behaving with respect to what that bond is. So when God tells us in the new covenant, I am putting my law in your mind and writing it on your hearts. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will help you to know me and I will be Helios, non-reactive to your unrighteousnesses and remember your sins no more. That's where faith begins biblically because we need to hear about the agreement and the bond. Then faith and faithfulness is conduct that is in keeping with that bond. Faith is the act or state of believing someone or something. And that's really where faith enters. God says, I am not judging your sin and I'm remembering it no more. So what faith would mean, believing that. Believing that when God says that, that he's real, that he's not counting. Faithfulness then is the state of being someone in whom complete confidence can be placed. And when we think of faithfulness, then great is thy faithfulness. God is someone we can trust. When God makes promises, he keeps them. And that's why beginning next week, we'll be thinking about a promise a week. And then having people talk about what it means, what that promise means and what it means to live in light of it. You can say in terms of the relationship between faith and faithfulness, faith leads to faithfulness when it comes to us being someone somebody can trust in. It's when we feel that God is trustworthy, and as that belief becomes deeper and deeper, we begin to develop trustworthiness ourselves. We experience trustworthiness. We extend trustworthiness. That seems to be the way it works. And a picture is, is worth a, a thousand words. Let's look at a scripture verse. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. He had been feeding the crowd and they didn't have food. He fed them miraculously. After he dismissed them, the disciples told them to to take off, go to the other side of the, the, the Sea of Galilee. He dismissed them. He went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land. It was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And so as they're making their way across the sea, uh, during the fourth watch of the night, I believe that 3 to 6 a.m., Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And then hearing that, Peter then chimes in, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, 
Lord, save me. What a great prayer. He didn't say, our Father who art in heaven. No, that's a good prayer. But he didn't have enough time to really recite a big prayer. And so he kind of just says what it is he needs to say. Lord, save me. Um, Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. In terms of an image then, it's an image of faithfulness and faith. Um, Faith biblically, if you look at Peter, he's kind of on the water and in it. Faith is not automatic. It's not something that we receive like a download. It's something that's developed. It's like a muscle. If you exercise a muscle, you develop it. As it develops, it gets stronger. You can't exercise and strengthen a muscle quickly. I really I remember the, the ad where this guy is trying to lose weight, and he um, walks around this, and he gets on the scale, and then he checks his weight, and then he, he walks around this room once, and then hops back on the scale. You know, and then it says the same, and so he's, he's hitting the scale because it, you know, it's obviously if he walked around the room, it should register. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, faith grows as we exercise faith, as we're in situations where we do feel overwhelmed, and we learn that God is faithful to us. But that is a long-term process. It's not automatic. Um, we grow in our faith. Let's look at how. Let's think about how it is we grow in our faith. And if we want our faith to grow and become stronger, how is it that we would go about seeing that happen? Uh, it says, this is what Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. The word believed, it's had faith in him. It's the word faith. So to the Jews who had faith in him, this is what Jesus said. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Again, these are Jews who saw Jesus, heard what he did, and said, you know what, I think he is God's son. And what Jesus indicated to them is that if they would continue to make room for his word, they would be his disciples. Disciple biblically is a learner. And the relationship between a disciple and a rabbi or teacher like Jesus is that the job of the disciple is to learn to see things the way the rabbi saw them. In that time, learning was oral. They didn't really rely on books. It was an oral tradition. So what would happen, the disciple would literally sit at the feet of the rabbi year after year, and in discussion would learn to think the way the rabbi thought. It wasn't a quick process, not just a matter of reading a book or taking a test. It would be listening, talking, listening, talking over time so that the disciple would learn to see and think the way the rabbi did. The formal process of a disciple sitting at the feet of a rabbi, it took about and that was Israel's doctorate level education. And that time span was about 15 years that they would, the first level of education was age six to 10, the sense 10 to 14. Then if you were a really good student, those individuals from age 15 to age 30 would bind themselves to a rabbi, sit at his feet, for a decade and a half, learning to see and think the way the rabbi saw and thought. Um, Disciples are learners. When Jesus said, but as many as received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. It's not talking, I don't believe, in John, when it says that in John 1.13. It's not saying they received him like into their heart. They, to receive a rabbi at that point was to see yourself, okay, I, you're the rabbi, 
I'm going to be your disciple. I'm going to sit at your feet. That's why disciples, it doesn't happen all of a sudden, but it's a process of putting yourself, well, what you're doing is you come, you think, you sit, you think, you come, you sit, you think. And that's what a process of being discipleship looks like. So the first thing in terms of how then is to make room for Jesus teaching, because that's what a disciple does. And what Jesus indicated, if you hold to my teaching, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Here's the interesting thing about having Jesus' word and trying to figure it out and understand it. As we hear it, think about it, and listen to it, his word doesn't just instruct us, it actually does things in us. What it indicates, the truth will gradually become obvious and we will be liberated by the truth. So the first step in terms of how faith grows is discipleship. Discipleship is a process of making room in our thoughts for Jesus' word, for the Bible words, for understanding what the Bible is all about. That's how growth in faith begins. Faith does not come from looking at ourselves; It comes from looking at Jesus teaching, the biblical teaching. Um, it's not just a matter of discipleship, though. There is another element, it would seem. Let's see. There was a, it's a, a, a verse we looked at. It's in the Old Testament. Look what it says. Moses is talking to the children of Israel who wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, and this is toward the end of that time. They're getting ready to go into the promised land, and he's kind of giving kind of a highlight of what happened. And this is what he said to them. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years. He humbled you causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He's describing the process. They were led in the wilderness for 40 years. They seemed to be going in circles. They seemed to be making mistakes, but God was leading them. It seemed chaotic, but God was leading them. And this is what he was doing. He was leading them and involving them in a process of being humble. This is a, seemed to be one of those things in the Bible that indicates who it is that ends up growing in faith. And what the Bible indicates, God gives grace to the humble. What does humility mean? Humility in the Bible is not being, oh, it's, it's, you know, sometimes we think of humility as being self-effacing. Oh, it was nothing. It was, that's not what humility means biblically. Humility is someone who understands they can't use what they have to get what they want. That's what humility is. Humility wasn't a a trait or virtue that was respected in the Roman Empire. It was something that a slave experienced because a slave in the Roman Empire couldn't use what they had to get what they want. They had no standing in the court. If you were the master of a slave and a slave wanted to swear out a complaint against you, and if that slave went to a, a, a place, a governmental place in Rome at the time, the slave would get kicked out because their voice didn't matter. They had no standing or bearing in the court. And that was the sense of humility. It was somebody who could not use political connections, material connections, emotional connections to get what they want. That's what humility was. It wasn't something that was aspired to. And when he talks about the process of humility, look what it indicates there. He caused them to hunger. And we talked about that. Hunger is a God-given alarm system that we are lacking something we need in order to live. It's something that we can't control. What he did, he caused them to hunger. 
And when you think of it, how does somebody cause somebody else to hunger? He doesn't give them what they need. That's what God did. He put them in places where they didn't get what it is that they needed. That was step one. He caused them to hunger. And then what he did, he fed them in an unexpected way. He caused this manna to form on the ground, and they learned to take enough manna for each day, which is part of how faith grows. We think of faith, it is the process of learning to trust God a day at a time. It's We all naturally, when we think about where we are now and our resources now, and we look at our resources now, and we think about our resources and our commitments into the future, naturally we think, oh, yeah, you know, I, I have enough for this. And I don't think we cannot think like that. But biblically, what God says, he wants us to trust him a day at a time. That's what the manna was like. When they tried to gather two days worth of manna, it, it, it spoiled. So faith is a process not only learning to trust in God, but learning to trust him, and we've talked about the question, what is the most difficult day to trust God? And the answer is today. Today's the hardest day to trust God because we think about what's coming up in the future and it's hard to just trust him that give me what I need today. And if we continue to learn to trust God with today's needs, he will give us what we need tomorrow. But God doesn't give us today the things we will need tomorrow. He gives tomorrow's stuff tomorrow. And faith is a process of learning to trust God a day at a time. And uh, frankly, folks, that's a really hard thing to do. Very difficult thing to do. I find it to be very challenging. And yet it seems to be part of the process. That's what he said. So caused them to hunger, fed them in an unexpected way, and taught them that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from his mouth. It goes on to say that, look at this next verse. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. We've talked about this. It seems that it's not just discipleship. That's important, but it's not the only thing that is going to be, we're going to encounter in terms of learning to have faith. What it suggests here is not just discipleship, but discipline. Discipline is not punishment. We've talked about this before. Discipline it's, it's more like exercise. If you, if you think about going to a great life wellness center or a, a wellness center um, as they're opening up and we're getting back in, into that thing, you know, you see people, if you, if you look in the weight machines, it's, you know, there's this guy and he has this bar and there's, there's heavy weights on and, and, you know, so he gets it off and he's going, and you say, this guy's being tortured. You know, it just, he doesn't look like he's having a happy time. And, but what's happening here is he's, he's in a place where there's tension, and the tension, as he learns to deal with it, develops muscle. And it really is the same with faith. When we get in a place where we don't have what we need today, we're hungering, it exercises our faith. And we, okay, but I didn't have what I needed, but day by day, Exercising faith causes faith to grow. It really is like that, like a muscle, and requires tension. So the reason why I say that, if we find, if you find, I find, that we're in places where we don't have what we want to have, we don't do what we want to do, we don't think what we want to think, and we don't feel what we want to feel, it's very natural for us to throw a penalty flag and say, somebody did something wrong. And the fact is, if our faith is going to grow, we are going to regularly encounter not having what we want to have. We will regularly encounter not doing what we want to do, not feeling what we want to feel, not thinking what we want to think, 
and learning to trust God is how faith develops. It's not just dis, dis, discipleship, it's discipline. And again, discipline is when somebody is working out, it's not just in order to remove what's unwanted. It's also about building what's wanted. Some I heard some people talk about God put me in this place because he's getting rid of anger, taking away something that shouldn't be there. That's not what discipline is about. It can be. It's also about developing positive things. Patience, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit are not magic, but they are developed. And faith is central to this. If you think about Jesus' disciples, and they had the best teacher that's ever walked the planet. And why was it that Judas wasn't changed by that? Or he was, but it didn't take. I want to suggest that if we've talked about this. The other disciples were from the northern part of Israel, and that was, they were seen as less than. You know, you didn't, they weren't the proud Jews. They weren't the ones who were the pedigree Jews. They didn't feel all that hot about themselves. They could look in their past, and they had been experienced a lot of discipline, a lot of very difficult things. The ones in the south, not quite the same. And Judas was from the south. It might have been the reason that he's, Jesus' teaching didn't take hold. There was the discipleship, but not necessarily the discipline, not necessarily the humility. We talked about a couple of things. We talked about what faith and faithfulness are. We talked about how it's developed by discipleship and by discipline. Briefly, we're going to look at another question, which is where? Where do we need to consider? Where do we place our faith? I want to look at a, a verse. It'll be the last one we'll look at. Here's what it says, Sick Peter. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, his glory and goodness, listen to what it says. He has given us his very great and precious promises. Now, it's going to talk about the promises. Listen to what it says. So that through them, and them being the promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And you know what it's saying there? That if we are going to do the do's and learn to do the do's and learn to not do the don'ts, that's going to be a process that we'll, 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 we'll need to root into his promises because it's the promises that give us the ability to participate in the divine nature. It is the promises that give us the ability to escape the corruption. So if you and I are going to grow in our faith, we're going to root our faith in promises because they have the power to promote in us that which he wants to create. It says for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. What it's going to do, it's going to talk about the things that will be placed on the foundation of faith, but I don't want us to lose sight of something. Faith is located on top of promises. That's the foundation. Now, when that faith foundation is in place, then we can add to that faith. And look what it talks about. For this very reason, add to your faith in the promises goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness 
and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. So it's like the substructure is faith. The superstructure, the part of the house that's above ground, are all these virtues. Um, so if we might want to be more self-controlled, our goodness, kindness, knowledgeable, loving our brother, loving others, we put those things, they are added to the foundation, which is faith. And then look what it indicates this is the last part of this verse. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's saying if these qualities are increasing, you're going to be productive and effective, both in, well, in terms of your relationship with God that will cause you to be who he wants you to be and do what he wants you to do. Now it's going to... It's going to ask a question. If these qualities are lacking, what would be the problem then? If these, pro if these qualities are lacking, look what he says. If anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. I am nearsighted. And so what this means, I have corrective lenses that I can see you, but if I take these lenses off, I can't see you very well. I am nearsighted. I can see this paper. I can't see this paper as clearly here, less clear, and, I, and I, I, you're very fuzzy. <laughs> because I can't see. It's not that you're fuzzy. You understand what I mean? Um, so what ended up happening with these individuals in the beginning of their Christian life, they could see that their sins were forgiven. They could see it. You know what happened in time? The longer they went, the more unclear they became. And what Peter is suggesting, and this is, if you get anything from this, this seems very significant to me. What he's suggesting to them is that the reason that these qualities are not growing in their lives, they had lost sight of forgiveness. Do you know what the foundation of faith is? Why don't you listen to me? The foundation of faith is this. God has initiated a new covenant with you. Faith is behavior and belief that honor that covenant. And you know what God says to you? I am going to put my law in your mind and write it on your heart. God's going to create responsiveness in you. That's what he promises. That's what he wants you to put your faith in. He says, I'm going to cause you to know me. God's going to make that happen. And faith believes that God's going to make that happen. You know what else he says to you? I will be helios to your unrighteousnesses. I will, helios means gracious, favorable, benevolent. I will be non-reactive to your unrighteousnesses and remember your sins no more. What Peter is suggesting, that the lack of virtues was created by the lost sight of forgiveness. That's why faith in forgiveness is foundational. When the foundation is placed little by little, and you know what that means? That thing you did yesterday? That, you know, the thing you did last week? Remember that thing? The thing you're not going to tell anybody about? God's not looking at it. You know what he says? I am Helios to your unrighteousnesses, and remember that sin no more. So God's face, this, is, this feels wrong, but it's what he says. God's face did not change after you did that thing. And you know what he wants you to do? He wants you to listen to me. He wants you to believe it. You know why? Because that's faith. And as we put our faith in his promises, we're going to find goodness 
kindness, knowledge, self-control, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, all the things are on the foundation of faith. That's why starting next week, we're going to look at a commitment, one of God's promises week by week, and have somebody talk about it. So then it will continue to keep in front of all of us his promises, because that's what we root our faith in when our faith is going to be strong. And again, it takes time. That's why we're not just going to do it one week. We'll continue to do it. And over time, little by little, little by little, our faith and our awareness of these promises will grow little by little by little. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your good purposes and promises. Um, they are, to our faith, what gasoline is to a car. They make it move. They make it grow. They make it go. I pray that you would continue to allow us to both know your words, to make room for them. You put us in places where we do struggle, and you don't put us in those places to punish us. Punishment is not discipline. Discipline is looking to what you're creating. It's punishment doesn't punishment looks at the past. Discipline looks to the future. It's corrective. It's not punitive. Continue to accomplish your purposes in and through us in Jesus' name. Amen.